This is a talk through of one of the new GCSE papers, uh, a practice paper for the new 9 to 1 Edexcel GCSE. So this is practice paper from set 3, paper 2H for the higher tier. As usual, I'm just going to give the solutions that are easiest for me to explain, not necessarily the best or the only solutions to each question. So in question 1, we've got a right angle triangle. Uh, with two sides and an angle marked, which indicates a right angle triangle trigonometry question. Work out the value of x and give your answer correct to one decimal place. So in this situation I have the angle, I have the hypotenuse, and I have the adjacent side to the angle, which means I'm going to be using cosine, and cosine x equals adjacent 8.3 over hypotenuse, which means that x equals cos to minus 1 of 8.3 over 9.5, and that equals 29.11036, etc. And that rounded to one decimal place is 29.1 degrees. Question 2. On July 1st, 2004, Jack invested £2,000 at 5% per annum compound interest. Work out the value of just Jack's investment on July 1st, 2006. Well, on July the 1st, 2005, he will have the first year of interest at 5%. And by July the 1st, 2006, he will have two years' worth of that interest, so that is the multiplier squared. So 2,000 times 1.05 squared is 2,205. Again, you could just write times 1.05 times 1.05 there for each of the years involved. Question 3. The diagram shows part of the design of a stained glass window and just checking the information, as always, that goes with the diagram to make sure everything is as it looks on the diagram. So ABC is an isosceles triangle, as marked here. BCD and ACE are straight lines, so there's no changing an angle here. That's a straight line all the way through in both cases. Angle DCE equals 67 degrees, as marked. Work out the size of the angle marked X, giving reasons for your answer. So the giving reasons for the answer is the key part here. I can see that that is an angle of 67 degrees because it's opposite that one, and that's also 67 degrees because of the isosceles triangle, so that's going to be 180 minus the 267s. So in terms of giving reasons, I've got angle ACB equals 67 degrees because vertically opposite angles are equal. And then I've got the next angle is angle ABC, this one here. Angle ABC equals 67 degrees because base angles, base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal. And then I've got the final one, which is angle X. Angle BAC equals 180 degrees minus 67 minus 67, which equals 46 degrees. And the reason for that is angles in a triangle add to 180. So this has got to the end. All of my calculations are justified. Every single calculation needs to be justified with for, to get the full mark for reasons. 
Uh, and now I need to finally state my answer, therefore, that x equals 46 degrees. And make sure that's stated clearly to get the final mark. Question four. Naomi is playing a board game. She must throw two fair dice. She must get a six on each dice to start the game. Work out the probability that she will not start the game on her first throw. Well, in order to do this, I'm going to work out the probability that she will start the game on her first throw by getting a double six. six. So probability... I'm just write P. Probability starts on first go. is probability of getting a six, which is one sixth, and the probability of getting another sixth, which is one sixth. So those two independent events multiplied together, which is one out of 36. Probability she doesn't start on first go is one minus the probability that she does. And so that is 35 out of 36. Which I'll put down here. Leaving it as a fraction is fine, because that's not going to be a neat decimal answer. So 35 out of 36 is the best answer to give for that question. Question 5. A company sells circular mirrors. The price P pounds of a mirror is proportional to the square of its radius R centimeters. I'm just going to immediately, before even going any further, just turn that into a proportionality statement with the square of its radius to make sure I don't miss that as I come back to the question. A mirror with a radius 20 centimeters has a price of 36 pounds. Find a formula for P in terms of R. Well, if P is proportional to R squared, that means that P equals some value times R squared. And I know that, well, I'm given these bits of information here, so 36 equals some value times by 20 squared. So 36 equals 400k, which means that k equals, if I divide both sides by 400, naught point naught nine equals k. And that means I can take that value for k and put it back into this formula here. So the formula that links p and r squared is p equals naught point naught nine r squared and that is a formula for p in terms of r question six the width of a rectangle is a whole number of centimeters a whole number of centimeters the length of the rectangle is nine centimeters longer than its width the perimeter of the rectangle is less than 200 centimeters. Find the greatest possible width of the rectangle. So I'm going to start out by drawing the rectangle, because that's always a helpful thing to do so that I can label the sides. The length is 9 centimeters longer than its width, so if the width is x, the length is x plus 9. Perimeter is going to be x plus x plus 9, and two of each of those, so 2 x plus x plus 9. So that is 4x. x plus x is 2x. 4x plus 18. And I know that 4x plus 18, the perimeter of the rectangle is less than 200 centimeters. So that is the perimeter of the rectangle. And with these worded uh, sentences, it's always good to just translate that exactly into a mathematical statement for 4x plus 18 is less than 200 centimeters. Solving this equation, subtract 18 from both sides. 4x is less than 182. Divide by 4. x is less than 182 divided by 4 is 45.5. If x is less than 45.5, but it's a whole number of centimeters, the greatest possible width of the rectangle, remembering that x is the width of the rectangle, greatest possible width is 45 centimeters. Question 
Question seven. The diagram shows Diana's suitcase. The suitcase is the shape of a cuboid. Diana has a walking stick that folds, and the folded walking stick has a length of 60 centimeters. Diana wants to put the folded walking stick in the suitcase. Will the folded walking stick, stick fit in the suitcase? Well, first of all, I need to identify the longest length that can possibly fit in the suitcase, and that's going from across diagonal, diagonally across the case from one corner to the furthest opposite corner. Now, if I know the formula for 3D Pythagoras' theorem, because these are all right angles in here and here, because it's a cuboid, so all of these corners are right angles. If I know the formula for 3D Pythagoras' theorem, I know that this length here, which I'm going to call x, x squared is the square root of these three squared and added together. Forty five squared plus twenty squared plus thirty squared is square root of oops, x is the square root of that. I don't need an x squared on that side. X is the square root of three three two five, which equals fifty seven point six six two eight, etc. That is less than the length of the walking stick, so therefore it's not going to fit into the suitcase. But I need to show that clearly, and so this is actually worth the final communication mark, is not only saying no that it won't fit, but also saying that this is less than 60, to show that I've actually compared the answer I've got with the answer in the question. Even though that seems obvious, you have to show why you've come up with your answer, and y you've done that by comparing the result you got with that. So. No, Diana's stick won't fit. Now, if you didn't know the 3D Pythagoras pi for formula there, you could have attempted it by using the triangle down here and then using this triangle, right angle triangle here, to find side x. So you would have, on this side, you would have got, uh, I call that side y. So y equals root 20 squared plus 45 squared. Which is root 2425. Um, which I could work out as 49.24, etc. And then I use that y value and this 30 centimeters to work out x value again using Pythagoras' theorem. So x equals the square root of this one squared. So I'm just going to square it directly and put it into the brackets, plus 30 squared. And that is root 3325 again. So that also gets you to the answer. So you don't necessarily need to know that 3D Pythagoras' theorem formula. Obviously, it speeds things up. Speeds things up. Question eight. Draw the locus of all points which are equidistant from the lines AB and AC. I can't demonstrate this very well without compasses. This is effectively an angle bisector, but there are some details that are slightly different to an angle bisector. So to draw an angle bisector, you would start off by putting your compass point at the angle and drawing an arc that covers both sides. Obviously, this should be a uh, circular arc rather than the uh, one that I've drawn, which is not correct. You would then move your compasses, first of all, to that point there and draw an arc in here, and then to that point there and draw another arc at the same distance from there and then connect this corner through the points where those arcs cross. Now for a locus of all points which are equidistant from AB and AC, here we're just drawing the line of points where every point on the line is at an equal distance from that line and that line. 
but that continues and so should continue out this direction as well and that's an important part of answering this question is that the line goes right the way through there question nine in a sale normal prices are reduced by twenty percent a washing machine has a sale price of four six four how much money is the by how much money is the normal price of the washing machine reduced? So this is slightly unusual word, wording for a question like this, uh, and that flags up the fact that we are not just working out the reduction or the original price. We're working out the difference in actual money, how much money between the sale price and the original price. So if the original price, which we don't know, in order to f reduce it by twenty percent we would multiply it by 0 0.8, find 80% of the original price, and we would get to 464, the sale price. So to go back to the original price, I'm going to divide by 0 0.8, do the inverse, and 464 divided by 0 0.8 is 580. So the original price is 580. How much m By how much money is the normal price of the washing machine reduced? That means we're going to have to do 580 minus 464 and that is 100, 116 pounds question 10 uh, there's a misprint here which is very annoying this uh, should be 10 to the power of 10 written in standard form 10 to the power of 10 kilometers squared I have looked at this and tried to answer it as it is, but the first fact here tells us that the surface area of Jupiter is greater than the surface area of Earth, and that only happens if we're using 10 to the power of 10. So this question only makes sense with this wording. How many times greater is the surface area of Jupiter compared to the surface area of Earth? Give your answer in standard form. The first thing I'm going to do in this process is turn that number into standard form. So Earth, we've got 5.10072 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's moved 8 decimal places. So 5.10072 times 10 to the 8. Jupiter is given here. So how many times greater? We're going to put the value for Jupiter over the value for Earth. And the easiest way to do these is to cancel the indices and then do the difficult number calculation here. So that is the same as 6.21795 over 5.10072 times 10 to the power of 2, because they've 10 and the 8. When you divide the indices, you subtract the 8 from the 10. So doing that calculation on my calculator, 6.21795 divided by 5.10072 gives me 1.219033, etc., times 10 to the power of 2. And it asks, asks me to give my answer in standard form, so this is already in standard form with a number between 1 and 10 at the front. So that's one point. 219, and I'll leave it there with four significant figures in this case. Three significant figures would be fine as well. So 1.22 times 10 squared would also be okay for the three marks there. Question 11. 25 students in class A did a science exam. 30 students in class B did the same science exam. The mean mark for the 25 students in class A is 67.8. The mean mark for all the 55 students is 72.0 work out the mean mark for the students in class B. Well, for this we're going to need to look at total scores. So, total score overall for all pupils is the 55 students with an average of 72.0 each. So the total score overall is 3960. Total score in class A is 
and that is the 25 students with an average of 67.8 marks each, which is 1695. which means the total score for A, for B, total score for class B is 1,695. the overall total minus the total score for class A. Which is 2265. And that has to be shared between the 30 students in class B. So mean for B is 2265 divided by the 30 students which is 75.5 the key thing to avoid in a like question like this is to avoid just taking an average of those two scores or using those two scores to find some average it's always a key part of this question to find the totals involved because we have a different number of students in each class. If it was the same number of students in each class then yes you could just work out averages using those two scores but as it is we need to use the 25 and the 55 because there are different numbers of students in each class. Question 12 Describe fully the single transformation that maps triangle A onto triangle B. This wording here, single transformation, is really important because people often lose marks by saying that there's a combination of transformations going on, at which point you lose all marks that you might have gained for, for saying something correct. So it's really important that you stick to the single transformation that you're using in this case. We can see it's a rotation, uh, and a rotation needs the three bits of information. It needs the angle of rotation, how far it's rotated, the direction of rotation, and it needs a center of rotation, which just by looking I can see is it's not at the origin, which is the first place to look. And this one, if I rotate that around this point here, one four, that ends up rotating onto there. So rotation of ninety degrees clockwise from a onto B, that's clockwise, always check that you're going the order you expect. 90 degrees clockwise with center of rotation one across, four up. So rotation 90 degrees clockwise with center of rotation one four all needed to get the mark. You might have put about the point 0.14 or around 0.14 as long as it's clear that you've got all of those four bits of information in there. Question 13. Fred has a solid brass model of an Egyptian pyramid. The model has a volume of 3,000 centimeter cubed. I'm just going to write that on the diagram because it's useful to have labels to th with things. The density of the brass is 8.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Calculate the mass of the model and give your answer in kilograms. So if it's 8.5 grams for every centimeter cubed, and there are 3,000 centimeter cubed, mass equals 8.5 times by 3,000, and that equals 25,500 grams. And we need to give our answer in kilograms. So there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. So divide this by 1,000, and that is 25,000. So 25.5 kilograms. The model and the Egyptian pyramid are mathematically similar. The length of the base of the model is 25 centimeters. Again, label it on the drawing. 
The length of the base of the Egyptian pyramid is 225 meters. Calculate the volume of the Egyptian pyramid and give your answers in meters cubed. So here we have to look at the linear scale factor that takes us from 25 centimeters to 225 meters. So first of all I'm going to convert that into meters and I want to know the number that takes me from 0 0.25 to 225. This is in meters. And I do that by dividing 225 by 0.25 and I get 900. So that's a linear scale factor and here we're talking about volume. So we need the volume scale factor. The area scale factor is 900 squared and the volume scale factor is 900 cubed. So I'm going to take the volume of the small model which is 3000 centimeters cubed and I'm going to multiply it by that scale factor cubed. So 900 cubed times by 3000 is an enormous number 2.187 times 10 to the power of 12. Not surprising this is in centimeters cubed still. The volume of that pyramid is enormous. And so we now need to convert that into meters cubed and the danger here is that people will just divide by 100. But if this is a meter cubed, one meter cubed, to remember that this is 100 centimeters and this is 100 centimeters and this is also 100 centimeters if each of them is a meter. So one meter cubed is actually 100 times 100 times 100, one million centimeter cubed. One meter cubed is a million centimeter cubed, so I need to take this answer and divide it by one million. And that gives me 2187000 meters cubed which could also be written as 2.187 times 10 to the 6 meters cubed. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just to check that's correct, yes it is. So 2.187 times 10 to the 6 meters cubed or 2,187,000 meters cubed. Lots of potential mistakes to make there, so make sure that your units are correct the whole way through. Question 14. Here is a rectangular sheet of metal. A square hole is cut out of the metal. The length of the rectangle is 3x plus 5. The width of the rectangle is 2x plus 5. A squ the square has sides of length x plus 6. All measurements are centimetres. The perimeter of the square hole is 3 fifths of the perimeter of the rectangle. Work out the length of a side of the square hole. So I'm going to need to find out what x is here. My first step, what I want to do is turn this sentence into a mathematical statement. So the perimeter of the square hole first of all, let's write a note to myself, square, it's always important to label the things that you're calculating, square, uh, and it's actually the perimeter of the square rather than the area, so that is 4 lots of x plus 6, which is 4x plus 24. Perimeter of rectangle, is the four sides added together, so two lots of 3x plus 5 plus 2x plus 5. So collecting like terms there, that is two lots of 5x plus 10, which is 10x plus 20. And now that I've got an expression for the perimeter of the square and the perimeter of the rectangle, I am literally going to take the sentence and replace each section of it with an algebraic statement. So perimeter of the square hole 4x plus 24 is equals 3 fifths of 3 fifths times by perimeter of the rectangle perimeter of the rectangle put it in brackets to make sure that you're treating it as a single entity now in this case I could actually just work out 3 fifths of 10 and 20 but normally you then have to multiply both sides by 5 to get rid of the denominator. So that would give us 20x 
plus 120 equals 3 lots of 10x plus 20. So 20x plus 120 equals 30x plus 60. And then collecting terms on both sides, I'm going to subtract 20x from both sides. So that is me, leaves me with 120 equals 10x plus 60. Subtract the 60 from both sides. That gives me 60 equals 10x. And divide by 10, that gives me 6 equals x. And check what the question has asked you. Work out the length of a side of the square hole. Square hole is x plus 6, so x is 6. 6 plus 6 equals 12, and the answer is 12 centimetres, because all sides are in centimetres, it says here. Question 15. Expand and simplify this bracket, these three brackets. So I'm going to have to choose a pair of brackets to expand first. I'm going to choose these ones because they look easier. There's only a single x involved. So x minus 3, x plus 5. First, outsides, insides, last, x squared, plus 5x, minus 3x, minus 15. Collect the uh, central terms, that is x squared, plus 2x, minus 15. And I'm going to multiply that now by the original bracket, 2x plus 1. So every term in here needs to be multiplied by this term, so that is 2x cubed, plus 4x squared, plus uh, minus 30x plus x squared plus 2x minus 15 and now collect th the terms because it says to simplify as well that is 2x cubed plus 4x squared plus x squared that's plus 5x squared minus 30x plus 2x that's minus 28x minus 15 so that has collected all the like terms so my final answer is 2x cubed plus 5x squared, minus 28x, minus 15. It doesn't matter which pair of brackets you expand first. I chose that one, those pair, because it's easier. But um, you could also start off by expanding 2x plus 1 times x minus 3, or even 2x plus 1 times x plus 5. It really doesn't matter as long as you follow through the method and re uh, multiply your result by the remaining bracket. Part B of this question, make R the subject of 5R plus 1 equals A M plus R. The problem here is that we're asked to make R the subject and there are two instances of R in the formula. Whenever this happens, we need to get everything involving R to one side of the equal sign and everything else to the other side. So we'll start off by expanding the brackets on the right-hand side. 5R plus 1 equals A M plus A R. And now getting all of the terms involving r on one side of the equation. So that's 5r minus ar plus 1 equals am. And now I'm going to get everything else on the other side of the equation, so minus 1. That leaves me with 5r minus ar equals am minus 1. I now want to get rid of the two instances of r by factorizing. So I've collected all the r's on one side, and now I factorize the r and Instead of having two instances of the R, I now have one instance of the R, which means that I'm going to be able to get it on its own in the formula. So factorize, divide both sides by what's left in the brackets. And that gives me R equals AM minus 1 over 5 minus A. And that is my final answer there. Question 16. A, B, and C are points on the circumference of a circle. The straight line PAQ is a tangent to the circle. PAC is 50 degrees, 56 degrees, and ACB is 75 degrees. Work out the size of the angle marked X. Give reasons for each stage of your working. Well, by looking at this, I can see that the circle theorem involved here is the alternate segment theorem, which states that the angle between a chord and a tangent is equal to the angle 
in the alternate segment. The alternate segment here, remembering that the segment is part of a circle that is cut off by a chord. This is the original segment that we're talking about, the angle between the tangent and the chord, which means that the rest of the circle here is the alternate segment. So the angle in the alternate segment is equal to that. So that is angle CBA. Angle CBA equals 56 degrees because of that reason there. So I'll label that 56 degrees. And then, of course, we've got angles in a triangle adding up to 180. So angle CAB equals 180 minus 56 minus 75, which equals 49. And the reason for that is because angles in a triangle add to 180 degrees. Even though that may be really obvious, you still need to state it to make sure you get your full marks for your working. So finally, make sure I get all the marks. X equals 49 degrees. Make sure that statement is clear at the end. Question 17. Again, read through all of the details of the question to make sure that it matches the drawing that's here and there's nothing unexpected in that drawing. There is a Coast Guard station at point A and at point B. B is due east of A, meaning that the angle in here must be 90 degrees. I'm going to mark that in. Every bit of information you get, you should mark into the diagram, meaning that also is 90 degrees in here. The distance from A to B is 12 kilometers. There is a rowing bo boat at point R. R is on a bearing of 160 degrees from A, which is where that 160 comes in. R is on a bearing of 220 degrees from B. There is a speedboat at point T. T is 5 kil kilometers due south of A. So that tells us that this is 180 degrees in here, exactly as it looks, straight line from north to south there. Work out the shortest distance from T to R, so we're going to be looking for that length in there. Give your answer correct to one decimal place, you must show all your working. So I'm going to start off by labeling the length I want to find as X, distance between T and R. In this problem, I need to find a length uh, from a triangle where I have one length. I can find the angle in here. But in order to use a cosine rule, I'm going to need to know that length there. That length I could find out either by using, uh, well, the sine rule is what's going to help here. If I know this length and I can work out this angle, then I'll be able to use the sine rule to connect any other pair of length and angle. So in this case, I'm going to try and work out each of these angles, then use the sine rule to get this length here, and then use the cosine rule to work out this length here. So it doesn't say to give reasons, but it does say to show all working. So I'm going to say this is, if that's 180 degrees that far, then this in here is 40 degrees, 180 well, 220 minus 180 is 40 degrees. So that goes in here, meaning that this here must be 50 degrees because this is 90 degrees. So 90 degrees minus 40 equals 50 degrees, and that gives me this angle here. Um, this angle in here, 160 minus 90 degrees is 70 degrees. So that's 70 degrees in there. And that means that this one in here must be 60 degrees because 180 minus 70 minus 50 is 60 degrees. Now that we've got that, I can use the sine rule with these opposite side and angle 
and that opposite side and angle. So I'm looking for length AR, so that's the first thing I write down using the sine rule. AR over sine of the opposite angle, sine 50, equals 12 over sine 60. So AR equals 12 sine 60 over, whoops, sine 50 over sine 60. That's multiplying both sides by sine 50. And I'm going to work that out in my calculator. Sine 50 times by 12 divided by sine 60, which is 10.6146. Two, three, etc. So that's that length there. Then using cosine rule, cosine rule when we're looking for a side is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. Remembering that b and c, the sides either side of this angle, are interchangeable, so B and C can be either way around, and the one that we're looking for is the one that's on its own, A squared. This angle in here we need to work out, um, not too difficult to do, we've already got that as 70, so that's got to be another 20 degrees. I'll just write down the working for that there. 90 degrees minus 70 degrees is 20 degrees. So in this formula I've got X squared, the side I'm looking for is 5 squared, I've chosen b to be 5, plus this value, 10.61 squared. Well, I'm going to use the full value. Minus 2 times b, 5, times c, times by the cos of 20. So I have my answer times by 2 times by 5 times by cos 20. And I'm going to do 10.614623 squared minus the previous answer. And then I'm going to add 5 squared to that. So x squared equals 37 point nine two five three etc meaning that x equals the square root of that which is six point one five eight three and I've uh, been asked to give my answer to one decimal place so that is x equals six point two kilometers all lengths are in kilometers so that's my final answer there complicated question for five marks involving sine rule followed by the cosine rule, which seems to be a feature of these papers. Question 18. The diagram shows part of a curve with equation y equals f of x, so we don't know what that function is, we just know that it looks like this. Write down the coordinates of the points where the graph y equals f of x minus 2 crosses the x-axis. So when it's in brackets, it affects the x-direction, means it's moving horizontally and when it's in the brackets it has the opposite effect of what you might expect at first glance x minus 2 means that the inputs have all been subtracted by 2 meaning that the graph will move to the right 2 so if I just attempt to draw over this graph what's happened here is that this graph has been moved two places to the right. And we're asked for the coordinates of the points where the graph crosses the x-axis, which is here and here. So that uh, that's the coordinate of 2, 0. And 6, 0.
We then asked, write down the coordinates of the point where the graph y equals f of x minus 2, same graph, crosses the y-axis. So this crosses the y-axis. We can see that this original graph has moved, this point has moved across 2, so it's gone from minus 2 across to here. So it crosses the y-axis at 0, 4. And on the diagram above, sketch the graph of y equals f of x plus 2. This is outside the brackets, so it affects the y direction. And it's an increase of 2 in the y direction. This is the function. Everything has 2 added to it, so it shifts 2 places up. So I'm going to take that sketch that I did before and move it instead of 2 places to the right. I'm going to move it back to the original and then 2 places up. And marks here go for it crossing these points here and generally looking like it's been moved two places up. Question 19. The graph shows the velocity v meters per second of a rocket at t time seconds. So this is a velocity time graph or a speed time graph because velocity is the same as speed when we're looking at a graph like this. Velocity is speed. Find an estimate for the rate of change of the velocity of the rocket at t equals 2. It's actually asking for the acceleration there, but rate of change tells us that's another word, another way of saying gradient. So if we're trying to find the gradient of this graph at t equals 2, I'm going to need to draw a straight line, a tangent that meets the graph at 2 which looks about like that. So this is the point where I'm crossing. And in order to find the gradient of that tangent, I need to look at two points on that line. So this looks like a sensible point to choose. And the original, th the actual point 2 that I've put in there. So gradient is change of y divided by change in x. So I look at the y-coordinate of this point here, 20, that is 19.5. I'm going to check my scale, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So that is 19.5, and this value here is 8.5. So 19.5 minus 8.5 divided by the change in x values, which is going from 3 to 2. So 19.5 minus 8.5 is a gradient of 11. Which is the acceleration. 11 meters per second squared. Part B, find an estimate for the distance traveled by the rocket in the first four seconds. Use four strips of equal width. First four seconds, zero to four seconds then. And I need to draw on my graph the four equal strips, so each point is going to be a strip. And that's going to mean that I end up with... Oops. Uh, three trapezia and one triangle. And I'm going to zoom in on that graph and label each value here. So this is 63, it looks like. 1, 2, 3, where it crosses the axis. So this is a height of 63. This is a height of 25. This has a height of, I've already looked at it, 19.5, uh, no, 8.5. And this has a height of 1.5. So I'm going to use those values to work out the area of each of those sections and then add them together to find the total area under the graph. So area of this trapezium here is half of 63 plus 25 times by the width, which is 1. And then the next one is half times by 25 plus 8.5 
times 1, then half of 8.5 plus 1.5 times 1, and the triangle is just half the base, which is 1, times by the height, which is 1.5. And so each of these That's 44. There is a little bit of room for error with these because the graph um, is difficult to read accurately, particularly when you've drawn on it. So the mark scheme allows one unit of error in each direction. That's 5, and that's 0.75. So just to make sure I'm showing for my full method, I've got all of these for the areas down there. And I'm going to, in order to answer the question below, add all of those areas, areas together. So 44 plus 16.75 plus 5 plus 0.75. And that gives me... sixty six point five meters remembering that the area under a speed time graph is representing the distance traveled that's given away by the using four stri strips of equal width now question question twenty and this is a really difficult question involving an exponential um, function so Reese has a beehive the number of bees in the beehive is decreasing. Reese counts the number of bees in the hive at the start of week 5, and he counts the number of bees in the hive at the start of week 7. Here are his results. So 1,200 bees at week 5, 900 bees in week 7. Assuming that the population of bees is decreasing exponentially, how many bees were there at the start of week 2? You must show you're working. Well, the fact that it's decreasing exponentially means that there is some constant value which is being multiplied between each week. So let's call that value x. 12,000 times by the x gives you the value in week 6. So let's call this week 5. 6 it's times by x, and 7 it's times by x again. And in week 7, that is 900 bees. So we need to work out what it's being multiplied by each week. So that is 12,000 x squared equals 900, meaning that x squared equals 900 over 1,200. And that is 3 quarters, which means that x equals square root of 3 quarters. Now, if I want to find out what it has, what the number of bees in week two, I'm going to have to work backwards from week five. So, if we're working forwards, we're multiplying by this value, root three quarters. If we're working backwards, we're going to divide by this value. So, week five is 12,000. Week four, 12,000 divided by root 3 over 4. Week 3, 12,000 divided by 3 over 4. Let's say root 3 over 4 squared, because it's two weeks, which is the same as 1,200 divided by, root, uh, by 3 over 4. The square root and the square cancel each other out. So 12,000 divided by 3 quarters is 1,600. Week 2, we have to divide by this root 3 over 4 again. So week 2 is 16,000 divided by root 3 over 4. And that is 1847.5208, etc. It hasn't said specifically that I need to give a number of decimal places. That's because I'm talking about bees. So I'll give a whole number of bees. 
And I'm going to round up and say that that is 1848Bs. Incidentally, if you put 1847Bs, you would also be correct. You'd get the correct mark there, the full marks. That is a very difficult question. Um, in terms of a formula for each week, we would have the number of Bs at the start times by some number week one be once, week two would be twice, week three would be three to the power of three, etc. This is the exponential curve that's going on, and the decrease on a graph would look like that sort of shape. Question 21, final question, three marks. Calculate, oh, a trapezium, A, B, C, D, has an area of 5 root 6 centimeters squared, AB is 4 centimeters, BC is root 3 centimeters, DC is K centimeters, some unknown value. Calculate the value of K, giving your answer in the form A root B minus C, where A, B, and C are positive integers. So all of these bits of information are important. A, B, and C, positive integers. Show each stage in your working. Well, I'm going to start off with area of a trapezium which is half a plus b, where a plus a and b are the parallel sides, times by the height, where that's the perpendicular height between them. So replacing each part of this with what's in the diagram, area is 5 root 6, which is 1 half of a, 4 centimeters, plus b, k centimeters, times by the height, root 3. And now I've got a formula where the only unknown is k, so I need to solve this for k. First of all, then, I'm going to divide by root 3. That gives me 5 root 6 over root 3 equals half of 4 plus k. And if I times both sides by 2, that gives me 10 root 6 over root 3 equals 4 plus k. So subtract 4 from both sides and that gives me 10 root 6 over root 3 minus 4 equals k, which is the correct answer but not in the correct form yet because we need to have it in the form a root b minus c where a, b and c are positive integers. So combining these square roots, root 6 divided by root 3 is the same as square root of root 6 over 3 using rules of thirds, which is the same as root 2. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So dealing with that section, if root 6 over root 3 is root 2, this gives us k equals 10 root 2 minus 4. And now each of these is a positive integer just as we were asked to do in the question, A, B, and C positive integers. And that is the end of the paper. There may well be some alternative ways of getting the answers, so I might go and uh, go through those in a separate video. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them below or ask me in class. And that's the end of the paper. <laughs>